Thank you so much, Abigail, and uh, thank you, Allison. Thank you, all of you, for coming out into this weather. I'm really impressed and very thankful um, and, uh, and really looking forward to the day. We um, had a, a small dinner last night to thank our speakers, and at that dinner I said, you know, what, what is so exciting to me, what gives me hope, is how fascinating and interesting everybody who works in sustainability is, right? Whether you're studying it or working in it, you're dealing with change management, you're dealing with uh, intersectionality, a lot of different topics. You're having to be persuasive throughout your whole organization. Um, sometimes it's challenging, but a lot of times it's fun and it's impactful. So thank you all for the great work you're doing. Round of applause for you, okay. <laughs> all right, so today, um, center, what we do, we aim to help you unleash the business value of sustainability, the transformative potential of business to solve societal challenges at speed and at scale, as John Doerr has said most recently. This is where we need to go. We at Stern, at the Center for Sustainable Business, are working to um, innovate in our educational offerings, to also innovate and provide very hands-on practical research, which we'll talk a bit about today and to help you as business leaders and partnerships with business breakthroughs. So we hope and are your partner in moving forward. So what, I'm gonna run through a sort of a, a little research roundup on the things we've been working on today and you'll hear a little bit more about some of them during the rest of the day. So I wanna talk first, and I'll go through a couple slides on this, to say that ESG reporting is not the same thing as sustainability, right? And one of the challenges we have with the backlash is how we think about ESG reporting, that sometimes people are just reporting as opposed to actually acting. So we'll talk a bit about that. Trouble with job metrics. We've done a little bit of research uh, to look at some of the challenges around the lack of good data related to jobs. Looking at private equity and the incredibly important role it can play in helping companies with this transformation, or not. <laughs> um, data tools. Uh, to help companies and public policymakers work together to tackle some of the big challenges of the day, which we'll look at through our Invest NYC SDG initiative. I'm going to give you a, a, a short uh, look at our consumer work, which you'll hear more about later in the afternoon, and then a few updates on our um, return on sustainability investment methodology that we've been working, as you know, um, around the world to help companies better track their returns so that they're able to invest at speed and scale. So, starting with ESG reporting, not the same as sustainability. Don't let anybody tell you that, right? ESG is a system of measurement. It is not a strategy, right? ESG reporting metrics, and we're gonna look at this, are process and output based, so they don't help you understand performance, whether it's ESG performance or financial performance. They're helpful, but they are not a substitute for KPIs that are organized or focused on performance. Tick the box reporting does not drive value, right? And unfortunately, we're seeing quite a bit of that happen today. Um, and one of our meta-analyses that we did a couple years ago, you know, across all of these different studies, absolutely found that that tick the box reporting did not drive better financial performance. And ESG accounting metrics currently are not tied to financial metrics. We don't understand how they're integrated, right? And that's a real challenge. That's what we work on with Rosie. So just to um, make sure that we're clear about this challenge around outputs versus inputs, right? I'm just going to give you a tiny little lecture here, a little, little one. Um, so let's just say you as a company say, we want to have a diverse and inclusive workplace um, that is creative and that drives more creativity and productivity. To do that, we have to define what we mean by diverse, we have to define what we mean by inclusive, and then we have to figure out how we're gonna find out if that actually drives creativity and productivity. To do that, we'll have a series of different actions that we're gonna take, right? So we gotta, let's say, have some inputs, like we need to hire a chief diversity officer, that's an input. We're gonna have some activities, we're gonna develop a DNI policy, we're gonna develop some training, those are activities. Outputs, we're gonna have a diversity inclusion policy, and we're gonna have 50 managers trained. Outputs is what you see most reporting metrics focus on, all right? But just because you have 50 managers trained and just because you have a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy does not mean that you've actually moved the needle on anything, right? 
So moving to outcomes, so let's say then absolutely you've done this work and actually you've increased the percentage of black managers at senior leadership uh, to some point on your goal. You have now 100% equitable pay across gender. You have your employees reporting that they feel more included based on the definition that you've designed earlier. And then you can build that back up into your impacts, right? So you know where your targets are and you can figure out if you've actually aligned. The challenge here is do not let your companies or if investors, do not let your analysis stop at the output because that is problematic in terms of actual impacts from a societal perspective, but also from a financial perspective. So I think what's happening, with, I think SASB is a great um, institution, and I think them now being part of ISSB is terrific that we will have a global reporting standard. Global reporting standards by, in and of themselves necessarily need to be somewhat focused on outputs rather than impacts and outcomes because they have to handle so many different com com uh, companies with so many different um, baselines in so many different regions of the world with so many different sizes. But because of that, we need to understand the weakness of the standards, right? So I just wanted to show you here for apparel, accessories, and footwear reporting. They have a couple of different areas, right? So one area is management of chemicals, a lot of chemicals used in this space. If you look at what they use here to determine uh, impact or performance related to chemicals, you have to tell them that you've discussed processes to maintain compliance with chemicals. You have to tell them whether you have processes to assess and manage risk. None of that tells you how you've actually performed on your chemical management, right? So if I were to put in some metrics, I might say, what are some current volumes of key toxic chemicals? Give them a list. What's your time-based reduction strategy or your substitution strategy? Right? Then I could tell what's actually happening there. And by the way, from a performance perspective, if indeed you put that in place, you, you are going to reduce your exposure to regulatory risk. You may increase operational efficiencies as you reduce the need for chemicals and energy and water. You may have competitive advantage because now you have a product that's less toxic that, that um, can be passed on to the brand. Right? All of those things can drive better financial performance. So again, as you use these metrics, um, be sure that you're understanding how you're using them to manage and drive better performance. And just you know, a couple of other ones you can see here that these are really outputs. They don't tell you about the outcomes, right? They don't tell you, well, okay, so I have these people, some percentage of my tier supplier facilities um, in compliance with wastewater discharge permits. Okay, good. So what? It's 20%. What does that mean? Where am I going? What, you know, what does that mean in terms of water quality? No idea. Um, and then just you know, similar looking at labor conditions in the supply chain, raw material sourcing. So there are ways to take SASB, um, and again, these will be ISSB metrics. There's ways to take them and say, like in this last one, amount of priority raw materials purchased by material um, certified to a third party environmental social standard by standard. So you could turn that into an outcome by having a robust standard, being very specific about the standard, knowing what the standard actually delivers in terms of environmental and social impact, and we can also, in the public research, that, uh, the marketing research we're doing, we can see that, in fact, consumers do buy certified product to credible third-party standards. So then you could start to tie that to more of a performance-based metric, right? So again, just to, to help you think through, uh, and I wrote a piece about this for HBR, so if you want it in more detail, you can go to HBR. Um, but I think very important to understand what's missing. And then even if you look at SASB, um, the material topics, the four that I showed you, there's a bunch missing. I mean, greenhouse gas emissions for the apparel sector are quite significant. Animal welfare, big deal in some of it. Waste and water management, product design and life cycle management, nothing in there about circularity, which is the biggest and growing new business opportunity in apparel, right? Not in the SASB standard. So again, not to, to rag on SASB, I think it's a terrific and important um, uh, standard, and I'm real, as I said, I'm thrilled that it's going to be part of the ISSB, but you've got to understand its limitations and not use it to manage to, not use it to manage performance against. So just to leave you with, none of these metrics capture the upside of investing in sustainability. And I'll just show you on the apparel, footwear, Nike, looked at the challenge that um, uppers on the sneakers, Nike sneakers, 
are generally, or all sneakers, have been sort of stamped out, leaving a lot of waste, right? You're stamping out these little bits of pieces, you leave a lot of waste, then you have to sew them all together. So they were looking two goals. One was a higher performing shoe, which meant lighter, and the other was to get rid of all that waste. So they came up with this fly knit technology that is a recycled strand of plastic that you weave together that creates the upper. It's 19% lighter. It's a um, billion dollar plus business. It's been a category disruptor. If you look around, everybody's now using that technique. They did that because they were doing two things. One, higher performance. Second, lower, wa lower uh, waste. None of that would show up in an ISSB standard, right? So leave you that to think through how you can work with your companies to ensure um, that type of performance. All right, sticking with metrics, I'm going to look at job metrics. Um, and I want to thank Ulrich Atz, who's a PhD student here, who's done uh, the bulk of this research. So first of all, just to look at US workplace stats, right? we have a challenge, as we all know. More than 51% of the Russell 1000 not paying their employees a living wage. More than half of US consumers living paycheck to paycheck uh, about a year ago, up from the year before. 32% of American adults cannot cover an emergency expenditure of $400. Less than one in four Americans think they're going to be able to save enough for retirement. Challenging, right? At the same time, I really love this article by Peter Capelli in HBR um, about account US accounting practices. In this country, our accounting drives really unsustainable approaches to our employees, right? Our employee salaries, benefits, et cetera, are treated as current fixed costs, not investments, when in fact, they're investments, just like capital, right? Um, employees are not treated as assets. They're treated as externalities. Benefits, vacations, and six days are treated as liabilities. Gap rules report, uh, require the reporting of the number of employees, but not workers who've been outsourced. So if you want to make your numbers look good, you outsource your people. Right? And then all of a sudden you look great because you've outsourced all the lower paid people. Managers incentivized to use vendors for leased workers um, because, again, that's below the line. But even though they're doing it because it looks better, actually a lot of academic literature finds that um, it reduces efficiency and lowers productivity. Um, unlike physical assets, which depreciate over time, people over time actually become more valuable. Right. Um, but that's not reflected in our accounting approaches. Um, and then outside the US, the International Finance uh, IFRS allows for more focus on people. So just to give you a little background on what some of the challenges are with our accounting that drives us towards unsustainable behavior with our, with our employees. So then we looked at the metrics to try to understand if we could track the data related to um, how companies are treating their people. right? And the job debt metrics, for any of you who've tracked them, who have not tracked them, they are a mess, OK? So to try to look at this public data, so there's, we looked sort of three areas here, business ba basics. So just to understand you know, like how many people you have, what kind of accidents do you have, et cetera. Um, then the key areas that most employees care about, the financial security uh, metrics. And then job excellence, things like benefits, um, health care, diversity, et cetera. Everything here in italics is not reported. Even those things in italics, like turnover, are rarely reported. Right? So minimum wage, living wage, health care benefits, not reported. So when we looked at them in more detail, what we see is, first of all, almost most of the S metrics for jobs are binary. In other words, yes, no. Do you have a workplace safety you know, program? Yes or no? for 40 to 80% of data. That data is not useful to assess how well a company's performing on this, right? Um, also, when raw metrics are continuous, in other words, you have an ability to say, I'm at 20%, 30%, whatever, um, such as percentage of diverse individuals in leadership, companies are not likely to report on them. <laughs> so we only get like, data um, uh, on sort of 10 to 30% actually report on those metrics. And then something like turnover, which is incredibly important financially, 12 to 50% of companies report it, but they generally don't separate out regretted versus non-regretted turnover, right? And that is also a very important financial element for you to understand. And then finally, when you look at the ESG ratings, um, no metrics for the value of pensions or health benefits. Why does this matter? Just to give you an example, um, there was some leaked material from Amazon. They have regretted attrition 
the people they don't want to leave, uh, between 69.5%, 81.73% across tier one to 10 employees. So this is everybody, not just the frontline workers, right? New York Times and some others looked at this for the frontline workers. Their own investigations found about 150% turnover. Only one of out of every three new hires in 2021 stayed with Amazon for more than 90 days. Their regretted and unregretted turnover cost them $8 billion. That's a quarter of their profits. That number is not anywhere found <laughs> when we're looking, when we're doing this analysis of companies, right? But it is material. So end of lecture on job metrics. This is something you'll be hearing more about from us. We hope to help improve the situation. But all of you can improve it. Investors in particular can start asking for this data. And companies can start reporting it. So here's the recommended ones that we think at minimum we should be requiring. Voluntary and an involuntary turnover. Everybody needs to be reporting that. Share of employees making a living wage. And business basics, such as things like, you know, depending on what it is, injury rates, investments, employees. And accounting for personnel expenses, not only as costs, but as investments. All right. So now, moving on. This is, you know, I'm, this is a whirlwind tour. There will be a test on the way out. <laughs> Anybody gets an A, gets to go to the virtual reality experience, which I will share in a minute. All right, so um, I want to thank uh, Julian Marchese, who's been working with us on this um, responsible investing work. Uh, he's been seconded to us by Arthur D. Little. I want to thank them as well. Um, and ClimateWorks has been funding us. And also Invest Industrial has been a key um, advisor here. Um, so we looked, we added a first phase of analysis to look at what constitutes responsible investing for the private equity sector. Um, and looked at how the P firm itself conducts its business and then how its portfolio companies conduct its business. As you know, um, private equity owns more and more companies. They're responsible for millions of jobs. Um, they're responsible for um, opportunities to really transform those companies. But we also see private equity extract value from the companies and not invest in them. So really um, interested to see how we can help private equity, um, both at the uh, investors in private equity and the companies themselves uh, improve practices with their, with their portfolio companies. So we did this analysis. We have a report out on that first phase. In the second phase, we've been working on um, understanding a set of tools that we can develop currently for private equity, but they'll be available. I think we'll be able to turn them into public market opportunities uh, and tools and uh, ultimately corporate tools. So we looked and um, interviewed 30 plus GPs and LPs. GPs are the general partners of the PE firm. LPs are the institutional investors or the investors. Um, looking across their first due diligence phase, uh, then their early investment, their holding and their exit to understand how they're tackling sustainability currently with their companies. Bottom line, what we hear is, um, for most PE firms, there are absolutely exceptions who really know what, you know, really are invested in understanding sustainability. But for the most part, um, they're trying to understand a few material issues, looking at SASB. Then they ask their portfolio companies to report against a few material SASB metrics, which then they give to the LPs who don't look at them. Right. So, and we heard this from both the, the limited partners themselves. We heard it from the inter institutional investors, and we heard from the GPs. Um, and we also heard that part of that is because, as we saw earlier, a lot of that data is not very helpful. It doesn't tell you all that much about performance and how things are moving forward. Um, so, one of the things that we wanted to do is really figure out how we can help with that challenge. So, there are two um, tools that we'll be working on. Um, the first is what I'm going to focus on today. One that I won't focus on today is working for um, due diligence with the institutional investors to help them better track actual performance metrics. But with the um, GPs, in other words, the partners at the PE firm, we want to develop a tool that will help them understand what are the material issues, uh, the strategies and the practices that you can implement with a company that you're considering purchasing. And then once you purchase it, how you put those sustainability practices in place and track the return on sustainability investment over time so that you understand as a PE firm that there are growth opportunities here. So first thing is we, much as I lambasted um, SASBs, again, I want to say a lot of respect, um, we, we, uh, we look at the material issues by SASB first as sort of to give you what the major risks and opportunities are. Then we've identified drop-down menu for each of those. Every 
strategy associated with that particular metric and what kind of practices you can put in place, as you see here with this energy management example, and then what kind of value drivers come from those practices. Because what we see is too many people think about this just as a risk mitigant and don't see it as an opportunity for operational efficiency, for growth and innovation, for employee engagement, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the PE firm will look and assess the target company against these different criteria and then decide across this, you know, sort of how well they rate, and then we have a rating for them. So just to give you an example here, this particular company did very well. We have a rating from one to five. So did very well on ecological impacts and greenhouse gas emissions, but not very well on labor practices and material sourcing and efficiency. So now we take them over to what are the opportunities in those two places, right, in terms of the different types of practices you can put in place in the value drivers, and they can decide whether or not this is a company they want to invest in to improve as a way to drive value, right? Or if there's too much risk, there's too much challenge because they don't think that they can get this company where it needs to be, so they decide not to invest in it. All right, moving on to the next topic. So Invest NYC SDG, um, run by Mariana Koval and um, with uh, terrific help from Wythe, Divya, and Kendra um, on designing public-private partnerships for sustainable, equitable New York City. We are here in New York. We want to give back to New York. We want to engage our students in New York. Um, plus, I'm a native New Yorker. Go New York. <laughs> so um, what we've done in Invest NYC is look at sort of the buckets of key issues where we could bring and aim to bring public-private partnerships and private sector financing to support food and health, sustainable mobility, the built environment, waste challenges, renewable energy, climate resiliency. And so, um, as Mariana likes to say, we've been acting as a midwife, um, where we've been trying to bring together all these different um, players to come to design projects that can support, for example, looking at Rikers Island and opportunity to, um, as that is decommissioned, to build uh, sustainable agriculture opportunities there, an anaerobic digester facility for composting, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna show you two tools that um, the team has built, and are, they're both in um, beta form, but we um, know that they'll be uh, available about, you know, under the next, during this next year. So the first one is looking at mapping all of the um, food being grown in New York City through the, both commercial operations, community gardens, um, the NYCHA housing, a uh, whole, whole bunch of areas who are actually growing food. And with this map, you can click on and find a whole series of different filters to understand what indeed um, they're growing. This is important as we learned during the pandemic that we actually need to make sure that there's sufficient access to food right, um, in uh, urban areas where when we have challenges, we may not be able to access them. And we know with climate change, there's gonna be more challenges around accessing, accessing our food. The second tool, I'm just gonna navigate in a little bit, hopefully if all the, my tech goes well, um, which is a tool to look here in New York City. We have what's called the New York City Climate Mobilization Act, which is aiming to ensure that we reduce the emissions in the city, which are, our greenhouse gas emissions are about 80%, uh, 70%, thank you, Mariana. 70% um, greenhouse gas emissions in, in New York come from our buildings. Um, we have this law that says you're gonna be penalized financially if you don't hit, those, um, hit the targets for energy retrofits, et cetera, by a certain date. Um, and so what we've done here is built a database with the Department of Buildings and the Department of Finance looking at every single building and how, what its emissions are, what its types of fuel are, um, how much fines it's gonna be eligible for under this, um, and also, most importantly, who is the mortgage lien holder? Because in order to get what's called PACE financing to do these retrofits, you have to deal with the fact that somebody may be holding a mortgage on the building, right, and has sort of first call. Um, also, what we find with these mortgage lien holders, these are banks like Chase, for example, is they could be PACE lenders themselves, right? And they have to be tackling their scope three emissions in their portfolio as part of the commitments that they're making, and their mortgages are a significant part of their scope three emissions. So this actually will tell any financial institution holding these mortgages what their financial emissions, what their um, uh, emissions are, and also what their, uh, 
So now, let's see. Is it on? It's here, right? So I'm going to just type in Chase. And you can see here the map shows you everything. And I'm going to, sorry, go there. Didn't work. Chase. So in the map now, we will see all of the Chase uh, mortgage holdings. So if we go down, we see they have 1,363. We can go down to the bottom and see all the carbon emissions that their buildings are responsible for, uh, what their penalties might be, right? what the types of um, uh, energy use is, is in their particular buildings. Then we can go up to the right and we can look at things like the energy grade. So let's just say, let's look at the D. How many buildings in Chase's portfolio are D? We've got uh, 744, right? Um, and so then you can also look at this and you can take a look at the individual buildings. I always have trouble navigating this thing. Um, anyway, you can see all the different information in terms of the type of fuel use, the building name, who owns the building, who owns the mortgage, what type of emissions, what type of fees, et cetera. So we're pretty excited about this. It is, we can go back now. It is, um, we think, going to be a very useful tool. Again, still got some bugs. We're working on it. But anybody who wants to engage with us around this project, please let us know. OK. So completely different shift. Talking about consumer purchasing. So you're going to hear from Randy Kronfel Sacco later today, who's been the lead researcher on this work. But I'm just going to remind you for the, and she'll kind of give you the updated 2022 numbers. Um, but I'm just going to give you a quick reminder for those of you who um, here have not heard from us before or have about the work we've been doing. So when I came to Stern, I said, you know, when I was running Rainforest Alliance, I kept hearing consumers don't want to purchase sustainable products. They're not willing to pay a premium, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, OK, let me, where's the data? There was no data. The data was all surveys, whether people were buying it. They were surveyed as to whether they were buying it, surveyed as to whether they thought they were going to buy it. There was no actual data on actual purchasing. So we work with IRI to look at hundreds of thousands of SKUs every year to understand the consumer purchasing of sustainable products. Uh, in 2021, it was 17%. You'll hear from Randy what it was in 2022. Um, but what's really interesting, it's responsible for really significant part of the growth, right? Um, and what we see is that there's a growing number of new products and consumer packaged goods that are introduced with sustainability attributes. In 2021, Nearly one out of every two new products introduced and sold in consumer packaged goods had sustainability attributes, right? Just a growing demand and interest in these products. We also saw in 2021 $3.4 billion of carbon labeled products sold, up from about $1.3 billion the year before, up from zero the year before that, right? So this is a trend that is here to stay, and we'll hear more about that from Randy. All right, and my final area of conversation. Um, looking at the return on sustainability investment, and in fact, a lot of the work we've been doing on the consumer side um, is plugging, we're plugging into this, to this work on, on the return on sustainable investment. So for the return on sustainable investment, what we're looking at is to understand different industries and what is driving better financial performance when you embed sustainability. Are we seeing operational efficiencies? Are we seeing innovation and growth? Are we seeing risk mitigation? Are we seeing uh, uh, supplier resiliency? Are we seeing improved stakeholder relations? Are we seeing improved employee retention and productivity, right? So understanding those um, through the lens of different sectors. So most recently, we've been working on the food and agriculture space. And here we've identified, and this ties back to what I was showing you before with private equity, right? 12 different strategies that tackle the, prime, the material ESG issues for food and agri. Everything from improving water security to circularity in food waste to animal welfare to nutritional uh, profile products, right? Whole series, and you know, you can see this is a very complicated space for the CPG industry, right? So again, when you're thinking about this strategically, those companies that actually understand how to manage for these topics will be winning because this is complicated. So we've been working with a number of different companies to understand 
when they apply different sustainability strategies, how does that drive better performance financially? So looking with Anheuser-Busch, we looked at nutrient management practices by barley growers around regenerative soil health management practices. And I'm going to show you the numbers for all this. Um, we looked with Applegate at a sustainable beef category, looking at certified regenerative hot dogs. Um, we looked with Hero at beef-friendly pollination, uh, pollinator-safe uh, jams. This is, I'm getting hungry, right? So. <laughs> beer, <laughs> hot dog, jams, okay. Cocoa, my favorite. Um, so Natra, working with Natra on looking at how responsible sourcing of cocoa can drive better performance. And Ingredion, looking at how do we reduce food waste through a biocontrol called aflatoxin. So as we look here, um, I'm sorry, and I forgot to acknowledge the whole team working on Rosie. I was like thinking about my transition, and then I didn't say, first of all, I want to say um, great Rosie team that we have, Chisra Amare, Elise Douglas, and the whole rest of the team working on Rosie. So my apologies for, for not saying that. Um, so nutrient management, here we go. Um, looking at this particular Anheuser-Busch example, right, we looked at how better practices at the field level um, in terms of regenerative approaches, but also in terms of processing, improved operating efficiencies, improved redu or reduced sales loss due to problematic product, and that also through this regenerative approach, they were able to um, have a sustainable product offering, which is actually the bulk of the benefit, but there were still significant benefits around efficiencies and avoidance of sale loss to the tune of about um, $40 million 10-year net present value and annual um, operating income improvement about 7.5 million. The interesting thing in all this is that we find over and over again that companies aren't set up to track and understand these types of returns. So my, my message to you is less about the specifics and more about the approach, right? Applegate um, also looked with them at their do good dog um, sourced again from verified regenerative U.S. grasslands. And here we found that the benefits were primarily around the sales and marketing. So about 63% over 10 years were going to be from sales and marketing. And then also because they were taking a real leadership role um, in this, first one out there with this, really um, positive uh, publicity benefits that we monetized. Again, you know, we find that companies don't actually monetize all the free media you get from being a leader, but it's actually real. <laughs> Um, Hero, so this is the, the bee-friendly jam. So here, working with farmers to improve pollination, which helps the, their business long-term, so it's a really important sustainability um, investment. Um, helps them with um, carbon sequestration, actually, so helps them with their scope three targets. Competitive advantage, first one to, to introduce a, a bee-friendly jam. And so here we found NPV before cost of about 3.6 million euros, annual operating income impact of about 650 euros, um, return on sustainability investment about 33%. I want to emphasize every time, and you know this having worked with your CFOs, every time we work with the CFOs on this, we take the most conservative numbers that you can possibly have. So these are all the very conservative numbers um, that I'm showing you. Um, sustainable sourcing and cocoa. So cocoa industry, I mean, it, it is got deforestation issues, you know, worker, uh, farmer, low income issues, um, challenges for the farmers to actually stay on the farms. And then also you've got regulatory pressures, uh, you know, more and more demand by consumers around responsible sourcing. If you are in cocoa and you are not managing for these issues, you are going to be challenged in terms of your business model. So here, looking at this benefit for Natra, um, we identified both uh, sales and marketing benefits, um, growth benefits, et cetera, to the tune of about 2.4 million euros, um, present value, and about 5.4% of EBITDA in 2020. So again, you know, point here is understand what these things um, can drive for you. You know, typically I hear from companies, well, I, I, you know, sustainable sourcing would be great, but I'm going to have to pay more, and I'm going to have to pass that on. But actually, one, you may be able to pass that on, as I'm showing you from the, the cu customer um, data. But even if you aren't, there are significant benefits for you in terms of reducing risk, improving the likelihood of your farmers to be able to stay in business, which keeps you in business. 
And then a uh, uh, final example on the agriculture front, um, looking at this aflatoxins. How many of you have heard of aflatoxins? Oh my, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, so they, they occur naturally in agriculture crops. They um, pose a, a health threat to all of us if consumed. And obviously, if that means if they're contaminated, you have to throw them away. So we worked with um, Ingredion's partner affiliate to look at this Aflapac biocontrol product to understand the kind of benefits that we might see. And there were really significant environmental benefits as well as really significant financial benefits and, and also benefits for human health. For the total of, for growers, a potential to increase their returns by about 13% because you know, when, when they have these challenges in their crops, they can't sell them, right? So it's a problem for them. And then company benefits uh, as well. We saw um, risk management for them, operating efficiencies as well, and, and improvements with stakeholder relations totaling about a 9.3 times return on investment, about 15 million plus over 10 years. So again, you know, significant benefits as a result of thinking these topics through in ways that unfortunately corporates don't currently for the most part. I'm going to share with you two other uh, quick rosy projects. Um, one working with our, our partner, ALO Advisors, uh, and Kimberly Clark, looking at um, a, a focus on the opportunity to invest in a green hydrogen project in the UK um, to help Kimberly Clark with their net zero commitments. Obviously, most importantly, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the question was, you know, financially, because it's a big investment, how is this going to work out for Kimberly Clark? So, first of all, we can see significant reduction in their UK scope one emissions, about 35% reduction. And then significant upside um, for the project, looking at sales growth. Um, uh, also, and this is important because we now have the IRA here, here we have subsidies, et cetera, in Europe. Um, the f financial benefits that are being stimulated by uh, public policy, right, is actually driving good um, uh, returns for companies as well. Um, so very few companies in the UK have decarbonized their thermal energy sources. So this is also an opportunity for leadership. So finally, an eight-year NPV of about 30, uh, 21 million net, estimated with an IRR of about 144%, payback period over 3.4 years. So looks like a good investment, right? Um, so exciting to see this kind of uh, work being done. And then now we're working on a new project um, with, a, um, with support from the Commonwealth Fund, looking at the business case for decarbonization in healthcare. So hopefully next year we'll have the results of this, but just to give you a sense of what we're thinking about here. So who knew, but healthcare is responsible for 4.5% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. And of course, in the US, we have to do everything bigger, right? So here, it's like double that. 8.5% um, of our emissions are from healthcare. Um, and it's growing. So we're looking at, for our ROSI analysis to understand what are the different strategies, levers, and practices around decarbonization in the healthcare sector, and then build out the business case so that the healthcare sector will actually invest in these shifts um, and develop some tools and insights which we aim to have gotten done by uh, end of 2023. So as we think about this, you know, there's the typical things you would think about, you know, energy in your building facilities for um, healthcare, um, lighting, energy efficiency, lower emission materials, et cetera. There's a the supply chain, which is really challenging because you've got medical devices, um, and you've got these devices that use energy. You've also got the challenge around um, you know, not reusing certain products, which then creates more challenges. My favorite, I'm like, who knew? So when you're, if any of you have been under anesthesia in an operating room, how many of you? Like, yeah, yeah, right? So there are different types of gases that they use on you. One of them has hardly any greenhouse gas emissions. The other, like, lights up the globe, right? So who knew? It's not, when I went in as a cons consumer, I'm not thinking about like, I don't want the greenhouse gas friendly emission, you know, <laughs> anesthesia, please, right? But actually, there is a greenhouse gas friendly anesthesia. And so it's a really interesting area to look at. Um, waste reduction, you know, huge challenge, right? And there's a challenge there that we, as we look at this, we need to comply, obviously, with government um, requirements around that. 
Um, so just to give you a quick little example, right? So as we think about, again, this sort of rosy approach, the practice we're looking at is to implement reprocessing, circularity in healthcare. So the hospital switches to reprocess medical devices, right? Um, again, in line with the FDA requirements. Then there's different benefits for them that we identify, such as carbon reductions, cost reduction for the medical devices, potentially potential future fines, um, et cetera. And then we look at how we are actually going to monetize that. What are the different um, criteria we have to put in place? And what I will say overall is we worked with dozens of companies on Rosie is um, nobody is set up to collect this information currently. Okay? So first of all, the ESG data is challenging to find. But finding how the ESG data relates to your financial data, you cannot do, right? I, there's some, obviously, there's some exceptions, like you, hopefully you know how much your sustainable product is um, making you, right? Um, but there's a whole series of other things that people are not looking at. And this is the opportunity that we at Center for Sustainable Business see for business in terms of scaling up and also, which leads us at some point to our next panel, um, creating the business case to fight back against the statement that sustainability slash ESG um, is a nice to have or a values based exercise um, as opposed to a must have strategic priority that is necessary for us all to our children to have the quality of life that we've had, but also is necessary for our businesses to continue to thrive. So we and Rosie are going to be um, uh, developing two open source tools with partners. Um, with LTM, LTI MindTree, we're developing a Rosie um, employee well-being tool that will enable you to input your own information and track financial returns related to that. And with Valutas, we're developing, again, an open source tool that will enable you to put in, um, sort of understand the financial value of various strategies associated with your greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, these will be, you know, because it's open source and sort of quick and dirty, it'll be quick and dirty. But it'll give you directionality and a way to then make the argument to your CFO or others that here now is an area that we need to be investing in to understand better. Recent publications from us, um, you'll hear more later about our new guide to embedding sustainability. We will also be developing an asynchronous course for that. Um, we have our Road to Responsible Private Equity has just been launched in, out on our website today. Um, and we have a new case study for any faculty here on measuring the financial return on sustainable investing in the chocolate industry based on the Natra case. Um, and we'll have um, a, a new study coming out shortly summarizing the work that we did in our Invest NYC SDG initiative that will be going out through the United Nations to cities around the world to help them understand how to bring private sector engagement to um, mo moving forward the sustainable development goals in their country. So let me, uh, whew, what do you think? <sighs> Thank you. I made it through with two minutes to spare. So anybody have a question for me? Yes, right here. Right uh, I can count. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Great um, intro and overview. Whirlwind. Um, so financial performance management. Yeah, I'm a consultant. I've gone into companies, helped them with their planning, their budgeting, their financial performance management. A lot of that ends up being check the box type reporting at the end of the day. Um, some companies, the high performers, they see beyond that, right? Le leadership, vision, all of that's important. Sounds like a similar kind of a problem, but on a bigger, more complex scale. So, you know, how are they similar? How are they different? If you can't fix it for the stuff people have been doing for a lot of years, how can we have hope that we can fix it for this bigger problem? Well, I think we are already seeing people make significant changes in how they do business. And um, it gives me hope that we will change it. I think. I never expected we would have the Inflation Reduction Act here in this country, for example. I did not think we would get that through. 
and we did. Um, and it's significant, is it perfect? No. But is it significant? Absolutely. And when we look at the leadership that we see in the European Union, um, you know, really significant change being driven. When we look at the younger generations, you know, the um, generations that I teach, they are committed to this and they want to do this and they are very adamant about that in terms of their purchasing, in terms of where they work. Not everybody, but many of them. Um, the other thing is, unfortunately, and this is what I, I wish I didn't have to say this, but the risk of climate change in particular is so horrific and what is going to be happening is going to be so bad that people will be forced to change no matter what, right? And uh, that's unfortunate because it's going to be, uh, create so much pain for so many people, but it will force change. And so hopefully we'll get enough positive change done. I, you know, in my travels around the world when I was running Grand Force Alliance, I, I heard so much hope in every corner of the world from illiterate cocoa farmers who like, were so committed to you know, lead policymakers who this was their life. So I, yes, I see all the problems, but I also see that there are many people really trying to change it. Yes, in the back. Oh, sorry, you'd already identified somebody? Sorry about that. <laughs> hey there, um, uh, my name's Bella. Um, I work for Climate Neutral, which is a nonprofit that works with companies to decarbonize um, through our standard. Um, I'm really excited about the Veluchis tool that you just described. That's super exciting and a tool that I think a lot of the companies we work with would find really valuable. Um, so I'm wondering two things. First, how can people contribute? If it's an open source effort, what data do you need to validate the tool? Um, how can nonprofits get involved? Um, and second, uh, who do you see as your users, both like at, for the code base itself um, and also the end product? Yeah, so for the users, it would be um, corporates. Again, it'll be a, 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 a tool light, right? We. Um, one of the things we've been talking about is, is how we might be able to access data because we're assuming people may be not wanting to have the data, you know, leave us with the data. So these are some issues that we're working through. Um, Chisra, if you can raise your hand wherever you are, is uh, over there. So Chisra, you could talk, speak with about the tool afterwards. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I, there's one, I'm sorry, there was one more that I can take in the back because I had said yes before and then I need to move on. I want to say, let's David. hear it for Tenzi. Let's hear it for Tenzi. Great stuff. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I did not plan. <laughs> she didn't plan me here. She didn't oh, plan me here. She yep. didn't plan me here. But Tenzi, uh, the school and your work, how many students are involved? How deep is this going within NYU? If you give us an overview, I really appreciate that. And keep up the great work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, just really quickly, we went from, for example, 50 students in our core MBA sustainability com for competitive advantage course a year ago to 200 this year. Right just to give you an example. We now have, um, uh, t uh, what is it, 6% of all students in the MBAs graduating with sustainable business innovation, you know, uh, sustainable business and innovation um, specialization, uh, which is the first time we broke the top 10. So we're seeing just growing demand, undergrads, graduates, people are coming to the school because of sustainability. So, good. All right, thank you so much. Oh, sorry. One other, had, had the mic, sorry. <laughs> uh, David Wilcox, Reach Scale. Everything in this space is a two-edged sword. You've got a fantastic upside edge on all the work that you're doing, great work. However, if you apply the scale lens to it, it never can assemble rapidly enough to move the needle. You mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act. You've got money cascading down through multiple administrations of the government being turned into hundreds of programs, none of them coordinated. There's no scale plan. The Aspen Institute basically said the difference between business as usual for the IRA is 188 gigawatts, max uptake is 450 gigawatts. 188 is treading water, 450 is moving the needle. There's no plan to get from 188 to 450. So how do you use networks to accelerate the congregation and aggregation of all of these individual small things so that you can actually do this fast enough to move the needle? Ha. Anybody have an answer? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. It's a very good question, and I do not have an answer in, in, a, in a minute, other than to say that I think um, we all need to be intentional and purposeful about the work we're doing, which is why I started off with the challenges around focusing on process versus performance. Right. So all we can do is what we can do. 
Um, I, you know, there'd be a lot of other bigger answers to give to you, but I think for the people here today, you know, focusing on ensuring that there is strong performance and impact in the work that you do, partnering not only with us, but with a whole, all of your value chain, your investors, government, et cetera, those partnerships are critical. So thank you very much. Now, before I turn it over to uh, uh, and introduce our next group, I just want to do a little shout out because, you know, technology is cool, right? So we have for you um, Arcadia Earth which has been experimenting with um, augmented reality and visual and virtual reality. Um, they're out here. You can look at uh, circular fashion and augmented reality, and you can look at um, all sorts of interesting climate change virtual reality opportunities We're running around into people with these things on. So enjoy during uh, uh, lunch and the break, and our thanks to Arcadia Earth and Valentino for offering this opportunity for all of you. So thank you so much. Now, let me find my note. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs>